It's the Monday Morning Show. Today is October 12th, 2018. Wait, October 12th? Seriously? I've been away for two months? Well, I suppose I've got a few things to talk about then. I'm Ken LaSalle from KenLaSalle.com, and, uh, well, what can I tell you? I went on a road trip. You can find the video for that still being posted over on my YouTube channel. Yes, I'm that slow. And I didn't realize just how much would change when I got home. Actually, the change has been happening for a while. I just didn't realize it until I got off the road. I had started working on two new autobiographical projects back in July with the goal of releasing them both in September and October, which is just about now. But don't worry about missing them because once I got back from my trip, I realized they couldn't be released. To put it bluntly, Neither project really lived up to my expectation of them. And quality control is an important part of this job. The fact that I didn't catch on to that fact until I nearly hit the release date told me I needed to slow way down. I was working myself too hard, which was really difficult to admit. And it was time to change the focus of my writing and uh, take it off of myself. Which brings me to this podcast. And isn't it funny how this podcast changes just about every year or so? We're a bit late for this change, but the time for change has come. Moving forward, at least for a little while... I'm not going to be talking about myself nearly as much on this podcast. My time for sharing has come to a bit of a close. I'm sure that every now and then I'll find something I just have to talk about in my own life. But I feel like I've kind of lost my way a little bit. And I need to reflect. In the past couple of months, I've sat down with my writing to get a feel for what I still enjoy, and I'm happy to say that my fiction titles are really holding up. I love Max Dedge, and I'm looking forward to writing the next book in the Work of Art series. And very soon, I'll be releasing the sequel to Heaven Enough. That's coming later this year. So my fiction releases are still going to be coming out as planned. But here on the Monday Morning Show, I decided I need to focus my message just a little bit. And that starts this week with a new segment I'm calling DC Home Companion. I've long been a fan of Garrison Keillor. The first time I heard his show was in the mid-1980s. NPR was impossible to find on the dial back then, but as the years continued, I listened to Garrison's show... More and more. Vicky took me to see the Prairie Home Companion live about a decade or so ago, and we absolutely loved it. Somewhere about a year ago, accusations of sexual misconduct were leveled against Garrison, accusations which he had already apologized for in person and in writing. He wasn't a serial pervert like many of those running our country into the ground right now. This happened once, and he apologized. So no, I'm not going to shy away from saying I admire his work or that I admire the man. He goofed, and he apologized, which is what we're raised to believe we should do. It was bad enough he retired, but was the national backlash against him touching a woman's back really necessary? Was the rebranding of his show, which, let's face it, isn't even his show anymore, really necessary? I don't think so. And like so many others, I'm sure I miss his stories, and I miss the way he told them. 
I'm also sick to death about the state of our nation, about the Republican traitors running it into the ground with glee, laughing as they light Rome on fire. And when I sat down to decide what I wanted to do with this podcast, I knew that what I really wanted was to talk about that. But see, here's the problem. The problem is, well, me. I tend to pontificate. I tend to preach, give lectures. I'm not a fan of that aspect of my work. And so I spent quite a bit of time pondering how I might be able to change that. And the answer, as it turns out, was right there in Garrison Keillor's work. Which is why, beginning this week, I will be featuring a new segment on this podcast called The DC Home Companion. Think of it as the News from Lake Wobegon segment of the Prairie Home Companion, but set in Washington, D.C. Sure, it's about politics, but it's also about people. People like Chuck Grassley, senator from Iowa, who is a questionable crossbreed of demon kind and care bears sacrificed by the John Birch Society. He's anti-everything and notoriously cheap. There's Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh, who believes everyone is a white male, and, little known fact, his every word is actually beer. And, of course, there's Lindsey Graham, so closeted the door is nailed shut. And he actually has fewer friends than Ted Cruz, though I heard that Ted Cruz rents his on a quarterly basis. You'll meet many others as well, I even snuck Kanye West into the first episode with all the other horribly out-of-touch white men. Because when you get right down to it, I'm a storyteller. And the good folk of Washington, D.C. are giving me quite a story to tell. And it should be a whole lot of fun. Until next time, then, and so we can get this show on the road, be good to yourself be kind to others, and let's make this world a better place. And now, with apologies to Garrison Keeler. Well, it's been a quiet week in Washington, D.C., my hometown, out there on the edge of the country. It's been warm. Chuck Grassley ran to his refrigerator's freezer on Wednesday to make sure he still had proof that global warming was a hoax. His discovery was a mixed blessing, of course. The freezer was still working as it had been since 1958. He didn't buy the freezer then. He's just notoriously cheap. He's been using that freezer to disprove scientists since 1983. But it kind of rubs him raw that a scientist invented refrigeration. Uppity scientists. But you keep a fridge that old because, at the very least... It still leaks dangerous coolants into the atmosphere, and Chuck's heard that every little bit helps. Lindsey Graham has been waiting by the phone, and so has been missing the leaves as they turn up and down the Potomac. He also hasn't seen a single protester outside of his house, holding signs that remind him of all the terrible things he's done, shouting slogans about all the terrible things he's done. Lindsay's reputation is fairly well known by now as the rabid chihuahua of American politics. Probably the only person who isn't aware of it is Lindsay himself. He doesn't want to know. In moments of great personal ennui, he heads down to his basement and asks Alex Hyde White in his cage down there what people must think. What must people think, Alex Hyde White? he asks. And if Alex is conscious, if he's been given water that week, he'll beg for release. And Lindsay will think that's a proposition and laugh with that incredibly manly laugh that only he believes he has. The Supreme Court witnessed the swearing-in of Brett Kavanaugh this week, and for his part, Brett Kavanaugh was happy to join the eight other white men on the court 
to join that proud tradition of white men holding judgment over a white nation. Ruth Bader Ginsburg found Brett's belief odd, to say the least. After all, she's been on the court for many years and was fairly confident that she was, in fact, a woman. Sotomayor wasn't even white. But this was the world Brett had come from. This was how he was raised. He grew up amongst white men, was educated by white men, raised by white men, employed by white men. To be honest, I don't think he could see the difference between white men and non-white men. And don't get me started on the subject of women. His wife, Ashley, has tried to explain to him, but uh, he calls her Ash. Sometimes he calls her pal or buddy. When she tried to use logic, telling him that only women could bear children, Brett wouldn't hear of it and ran from the room crying. To be honest, his three sexual experiences in life were shameful moments he would rather not consider. Two were with that dude, Ash, who later told him that they had somehow bore children. Probably a homo plot from the liberal court, giving more rights to gays than men had. Could men bear children? No. But have gay sex with a guy named Ash, and next thing you know... That was probably why he didn't talk to his roommate that often. Actually, Brett didn't talk to too many people. Or, I should say, not many people could understand a word that he said. Which is unfortunate, especially when you consider that he only speaks one word. The millions of people around the country and around the world who watched his testimony before the Senate probably thought they heard a fairly poorly spoken 100 or so word vocabulary, but that was due to some incredibly expensive translation software developed by white men, Brett was certain, because only they could translate Brett's one word. And his one word was this. Beer. That's what Brett was saying to the court. Beer, 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 beer. He might have sounded like a cheap alcoholic, but pass that through the translating software, and it comes out sounding very much like an overprivileged white boy child. So America really did have a choice. Understanding these key facts about Brett Kavanaugh, that he sees everyone as white men, and that he's been engaged in a self-destructive love affair with the cheapest pilsner ever made, Mickey's Big Mouth, can actually clear up much of the confusion surrounding his coronation as judge. For instance, that time at the party with Christine Ford wasn't a sexual assault, after all. He thought Christine was just another one of the guys that he was hazing. Sure, he's never actually had sex with a girl, and as far as he knew, he'd never seen a girl. And though he wasn't about to have sex with another guy, he was so drunk and horned up, any port in any storm was probably where he would eventually be heading. This guy, Chris, was just as good a port as any. And when he exploded on the Senate floor about beer... I like beer. I really like beer. I really, really... Re you got any beer? I want beer. Give me beer. Brett Monster must feed. Roar! That was actually the translator breaking down for a minute. It runs on a PC. It can only take so much. Ruth Bader Ginsburg had this all figured out, but then she is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. What she didn't realize was that when she took Brett down with several well-phrased digs about his hair, about his schoolboy's hair, about his cheap supercut's hair, 
she didn't realize that Brett was thinking that Babe Ruth, that's how he thinks of her as Babe Ruth. I don't see any resemblance either, but that's what he went with. He was thinking that Babe Ruth had a stupid haircut for a white man, too. Most white men have stupid haircuts, according to Brett. Stormy Daniel, that movie star pal of the president, has a stupid haircut. Mike Huckabee Sanders has a stupid haircut. And that white singer Trump had over to the White House this week, uh, Kenny West, has the dumbest haircut of any white guy Brett has ever seen. But that's what makes Kenny West so good, because he's so very white. Which is why Brett was able to stand in front of his best buddy Ash and their two sons and take his oath of office this week. Beer, 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 Trump. And that's the news from Washington, D.C. Where all the women are wrong, all the men are crooked, and all the children are screwed. <laughs>